There was never any suggestion that the two brothers would, would, would come face to face, where there has been in the past yeah. when he's been over. That's really interesting, and I think it's being picked up on that it almost was just taken as read that this time they wouldn't meet. Which in, which in itself, the silence tells its own story, doesn't it? But the fact that for this this time, no one expected the two of them to meet. And we didn't have any leaks coming from, from either camp that there, that there was going to be a potential meeting or that one wanted it and one didn't. And that probably suggests that the, the rift is pretty firmly cemented by this stage. I, don't, I know The Crown is fiction. Sure. Um, but in the, in the latest series of The Crown, one of my favourite scenes is when Harry and William are talking to each other and are talking about William potentially, be, well, you know, ultimately becoming king. Yeah. I think William says, I'll be William V. And Harry points out that William II, do you remember this scene where he said, oh, yeah. well, William II was, uh, was, had a terrible history because he was killed by his brother, also yeah. Prince Harry. Yeah, yeah, he And I thought was. it was a kind of delicious little, um, you know, little script in, in, in the... Yeah, crowd. it is. Um, so William II was out for a hunting trip and was hit by a stray arrow. And the theory goes that his brother, Prince Harry, who became Henry I, was just a little bit too quick to get to the treasury and lock down the capital. Mm. Um, whether that means Henry I is just really well prepared or knew something was coming, we don't know. But yeah, I mean, it's again, it's a good William and Harry mm. um, and with much higher stakes. Absolutely. And um, when Harry was over, so when he was over uh, in February, um, which I've got to commend him, to be quite frank. He, he knew his father had cancer. He wanted to come over and see him. The king didn't really want to see him. Mm. He was stopped from going to Sandringham. Is there anything historically comparable to that kind of situation where the, where the, where the king wanted to avoid his son? Yeah, I mean, well, not his son, but I have to now look back on myself after saying you can't compare him to Edward VIII, and I will compare him to okay. Edward VIII. <laughs> um, yes, so when Edward VIII, the ex-King Edward VIII, after he abdicated in 1936, he became Duke of Windsor. And when he would come back, sometimes for, for major events, like his brother's death in 1952, other times for shorter visits. His estranged sister-in-law, who became the Queen Mother, made it, you know, sort of said you had to be careful where you hosted him, and they would pick places where the royals had an out that they could leave at a certain right. point, um, because otherwise um, the Queen Mother's concern was that Edward VIII, or Duke of Windsor, sorry, would uh, hang around like a bad smell and inevitably ask for an increase in his allowance. So they... Well, this, this feels very similar to when Harry was over, to be honest. But so, it's just so, this <laughs> my view. The, so, the, the, so, the, the word was, the, the phrase was that, yeah, the aides were worried they'd never get rid of him when he was over. Oh, interesting. Yeah, so, the, yeah. so that is, there is a direct comparison. And the, yeah, the Queen Mother used to say, try to pick yeah. somewhere where there's something, and not just that there would be another event, but that you actually, the royal actually had to leave the building that they were in so that there was a, a clear and definite end point to the audience. I hope this isn't a curveball, but just, <laughs> just generally, what, what do you think about Harry's behaviour? You know, taking a step back over the, over the last yeah. four or five years, what do you think about his behaviour towards his family, knowing what we've known over the past, you know, thousand years of royal history? Yeah, whatever? that's a great question. Um, I suppose for me, I always am slightly dubious of memoirs and of sit-down interviews, partly because I think they feel incredibly cathartic at the time. But you then want to move on. But you, in, in the public's mind, you're trapped forever like a fly in amber with these interviews and memoirs. And what you've said lasts much longer than the feelings that you had when you said them. And I don't ever really see an example in history of someone giving one of these interviews, and not just royalty, but celebrities and politicians, who have not become frustrated by its legacy. And for the Sussexes to have done so many so close together, I think... I don't think it's a surprise that we've heard the Duchess of Sussex, uh, you know, allegedly say that she wants to move on. Mm. But the public moves on slower than the personalities do. The, you know, the, the public were invited into this. And I think for him, one of the more surprising things that, that happened was that this man who, you know, I always thought of as one of the great champions of, of privacy in the United Kingdom, and especially his family's privacy, you know, then did reveal some very private conversations, you know, including ones in the immediate, after, immediate aftermath of his grandfather's funeral. Uh, and that was very surprising to me that that's, that that's what he chose to do. Purely conjectural on my part. But I, I don't get the impression that he necessarily thought that the consequences of this would be as severe as they have been, or that it would land as badly with the public as it has. Now, it's important to note there are many people who were very moved by what the Sussexes said 
um, in a positive way, there were many who were outraged or dismissive or sceptical. And I think a lot of people who saw those interviews and read it felt that, that he had betrayed his family and some of them felt he'd betrayed the country. So that takes a lot longer. Uh, to, 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 to reconcile that. And I, there's an old phrase or something like, if you air your dirty laundry in public, it takes a lot longer for it to dry. Hmm. And I think that's a little bit of what we're seeing. But I also think it's worth remembering, you know, he, he, he was immensely popular before all of this. And, and I, I don't think anything really lasts forever. So you could see him win that popularity back. Well, I think it's telling since Spare, he's never gone down that route again. Do you know what I mean? He's never yeah, gone down to talking point. about the family again. He's, he's, completely, he's completely changed. And I remember someone at Buckingham Palace when, when the late great Queen was still alive, when, when things were put into her mouth, so when she had a statement or when mm. she said something, they said that these words last forever. So they're carefully crafted. Like, for instance, the recollections may vary. Yes. Um, that, kind, that kind of statement or, or the Annus Horribilis, they know that when the Queen says something, it's going to remain. Yeah. I'd wonder whether... Harry, when he sat down with his ghostwriter, maybe didn't didn't really think about that. Well, but that's he, just me thinking. No, well, he he wouldn't have been encouraged to see it that way. Um, with you know, if you're going into an editorial or publishing process, it, they're not going to be looking at this um, as something that is carved into the, you know the granite face of history. They're going to be looking at something that is in a memoir, and there you know this is a a market that is used to selling celebrity memoirs. And there will have been no one around him, I would imagine, who would have said this will last forever. Yeah. Uh, it's just a different, it's a different form of communication. And I think the difficulty is that, that he is someone who has you know, a very prominent social position. And, and actually what he says will have impact beyond simply a memoir. But I think I hadn't thought of that. You're right, he has kind of pulled it back. Mm. Uh, and actually, I think there were even interviews that he did uh, with Anderson Cooper and um, so Tom Bradbury, he did them as well, where he tried to, he kind of tried to pull some of the stuff back and said, like, we never said they were racist at all. Um, For many, it's too late, but let's see what happens. Yeah. One thing that Harry and Meghan have been doing, just moving on, is Nigeria. Yes. Um, loads and loads of pictures. Uh, we saw Meghan in so many outfits. I think someone counted up, it's about £125,000 worth of outfits. I'm not a fashion expert, as, as you can probably tell, but I think, you know, she was... She, she wanted to be photographed, she wanted to be seen. It wasn't a royal tour. Mm. Um, is it, is it, was it a troublesome trip, do you think, for the palace? Was it a successful trip for Harry and Meghan? What, what's your reading of, the, of this faux royal tour? Yeah, it is. I mean, I mean, when is a tour not a tour? It's a bit like beauties in the eye of the beholder, isn't it? Um, I mean, obviously, it's not... An, a, an official royal tour, but it looks and acts like one. And there were moments that were, that seemed quasi-official. You had the moment of God Save the King being played at, at public dinners and the Duke and Duchess of Sussex standing for that. I think from their perspective, from the Sussex's perspective, and particularly from the Duchess of Sussex perspective, it was a success. I mean, the, the headlines were, broadly speaking, overwhelmingly positive 